we invite um, Drew Shaw, uh, who is an environmental section manager at the Montgomery County Planning Commission, where he has worked since 1985 to talk about the Wissahickon and one of these complex systems uh, that are very, very challenging. Drew is a section manager and as a section manager, his primary responsibilities pertain to stormwater issues like those NIPTES permits that Casey was talking about, the Act 167 stormwater planning, um, as well as municipal waste planning, hazard mitigation planning, environmental protection, such as natural areas inventory and development review for environmental impacts. And he currently facilitates the Wissahickon Water Quality Improvement Plan Management Com Committee under contract with the Wissahickon Partnership. So welcome, Drew. Um, uh, hopefully, <laughs> John and Casey have set the stage for how we can do better uh, and, 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 and we can see it right here in the Wissahickon. Thank you for joining us. Right. Well, thank you very much, Eric, and, and welcome, everybody. Uh, yeah, I, the, uh, the way in which Casey and John's presentations have sort of set things up here is, is uh, wonderful. I don't think we could have uh, planned that uh, better. Uh, because Casey was talking about the various aspects of the Clean Water Act and the various uh, programs possible under the Clean Water Act. Uh, and then John was talking about how, how we're doing and, and where we are. Uh, and then I'd like to give you a presentation on a, uh, a project that's going on now, a plan that's being drafted now for um, action over a, a long implementation period in the Wissahickon uh, watershed um, <clears throat> that's related to uh, the Clean Water Act and uh, TMDLs. Uh, <clears throat> this is the Wissahickon Water Quality Improvement Plan. Uh, and I'd like to just uh, give you some background on that. Um, again, the, the connection between the Clean Water Act, the TMDL program, <clears throat> and the, and the Wissahick, and the, the Impaired Waters and Total Maximum Daily Load program is an important component of the Clean Water Act. And, and as you heard, states identify impaired waters or waters that are threatened um, with becoming impaired. And then they develop a, a TMDL for that uh, <clears throat> waterway. And then there's many examples of, of you know, successful TMDL programs. But uh, one of the problems is Pennsylvania has a lot of streams that are impaired. Just the volume of work that needs to be done is, is immense. And so you know, we see that about a third of the streams in Pennsylvania are impaired. The, the 2022 Integrated Water Quality Monitoring Report that DEP came out with um, found that uh, 27, almost 28,000 miles of streams are impaired. Montgomery County, uh, we've got nearly 1,000 miles of streams. 640 of them are uh, classified as impaired. And the Wissahickon uh, watershed, you can see down there with that little blue star in the bottom right-hand corner of Pennsylvania. Uh, is an impaired stream. And the impairments, it has several, um, include sediment, uh, and nutrients and just re well in 2015 uh, <clears throat> there was a, a TMDL for total phosphorus that was um, produced in draft uh, but never published so it's not in effect and <clears throat> in its place uh, the regulators uh, are uh, very generously uh, allowing us to work on this water quality improvement plan. One of the problems with the the TMDL program is that often the, the percent reductions that are asked for are very high, very strict. And whereas this is necessary, you know, according to the, the studies and the, and the data in order to bring the, the stream back into compliance, when it comes to uh, implementation uh, from a practical standpoint, it, it's very difficult and very extensive, uh, expensive. Uh, this is a chart from the draft TMDL for the WISIC and for the total phosphorus. Uh, shows very high percentage uh, removal rates uh, for the wastewater treatment plants, you know, 98, 99%. For the uh, point sources, and these are the municipalities with their MS4 programs, the same thing, uh, very high percentage removal rates. Uh, <clears throat> and this is very uh, expensive. And in fact, we were talking with um, one engineering firm about implementation uh, several years ago, you know, they were saying, well, if you, if you completely dismantled one of the wastewater treatment plants and rebuilt it from the ground up and you, you would be able to incorporate, you know, latest technology, 
and probably achieve these rates. But you know, that's hundreds of millions of dollars and it's very difficult to do. Um, so the technology might be out there somewhere, but incorporating it into our uh, wastewater treatment plants, into our MS4 programs, again, is, is technically very difficult. Possibly some folks say it's, it's not possible. Uh, it's, it's, we haven't really studied that, but it's, it's a concern. So there's, there's an issue of expense and uh, technical feasibility. And often many municipalities feel their only recourse is to is a legal one to sue the EPA. And, and, and that's not really <clears throat> desirable from, from either standpoint because it doesn't do anything to improve water quality. It just ties things up in the courts. It expends resources. Uh, and you know the EPA doesn't want to see this. So back in 2015, I think it was, or maybe a little before that, uh, they developed a long-term vision for assessment, restoration, and protection under the Clean Water Act 303D program, which is a long way of saying uh, there's an alternative uh, option to the TMDL. And what this, al this TMDL alternative does uh, <clears throat> is it provides an, uh, for effective integration of implementation efforts. These are alternative approaches uh, that are adaptively implemented to achieve those water quality goals, but it's like we're going to the same place, but we're taking a different route. And <clears throat> about a few years into our, our planning process, uh, we kind of felt like the TMDL alternative title was a little uh, vague. Uh, and folks were saying, well, it's just an alternative TMDL, correct? You're, you're doing just a different TMDL. And this is a different program completely in our minds. So we're thinking, uh, we began to refer to the, the plan as a water quality improvement plan. So you'll hear me say water quality improvement plan or QIP. And what I'm really talking about is this TMDL alternative. That's uh, an option under the uh, Clean Water Act. So the, the TMDL for phosphorus, total phosphorus in the Wissahickon was very strict. The municipalities were very concerned about it. There's four wastewater treatment plants in the watershed as well. So the EPA and DEPA, uh, DEP pulled together <clears throat> the municipalities, the treatment plants, several environmental non-governmental organizations and the county. And we met in Norristown at DEP's Southeast Regional Office uh, to discuss this long-term vision. Uh, and you know, it was described how it's offering an alternative to the TMDL process and, and how it, it can satisfy the, the goals and the intent uh, of the Clean Water Act, uh, but allows the municipalities to have a little more uh, uh, influence in, in, into how it's done. It's, it's, they're not entirely in the driver's seat, but they're, they're sharing it. Um, <clears throat> the EPA and the DEP at the time didn't offer to lead this effort. And this option has not been uh, followed in, in, in very many cases. So there's no guidance documents available. There's no um, process that we can look at that was done elsewhere and, and can compare it to you know, what we're doing. So it's kind of like uh, you know, forging a, a path through the wilderness. Um, and we offered to facilitate the process uh, because that's, that's one of the things we do. We bring everybody into the same room and we worked out solutions. Uh, and so the WISIC and Clean Water Partnership was the result. And this is uh, almost every municipality in the watershed is participating. The, the blue area on that map shows the participating municipalities. So it's 98% or something like that. It's a very high percentage of the watershed is, is participating. If you look really carefully, you can see a, a little bit, this is Worcester Township, a little bit of Horsham Township and a, a wee little bit of, of uh, Upper Moreland. They were such small amounts that the municipality said, well, you know, we, we're not going to really devote our time and resources to participating. We have no problem with what you're doing. They gave a letter of support. Uh, but they said it's such a small amount of our municipality that we're not going to participate. So we have almost total participation, and we've maintained that since 2015, which is uh, <clears throat> quite an accomplishment, I think. Uh, so the municipalities and the wastewater treatment plants are working together with several um, <clears throat> consulting uh, agencies with um, Wissick and Trails 
a watershed organization in the Wissahick. And if you're not familiar with it, they're, they've been around for a long time. They have a, a very good standing in the watershed. And as I mentioned, we're facilitating the effort. And our goal is <clears throat> the goal, uh, a similar goal to the, to the TMDL. Um, the draft TMDL said the impairment is to aquatic life. So we're looking to bring back the bugs. We wanna improve conditions to the point where you know, the bugs are <clears throat> uh, doing well. Uh, they're well-established, populations are growing. So we have to improve the IBI score. Uh, but this is an urbanized watershed and the hydrology is, is very uh, uh, disturbed. All of the land uh, development that's been going on, uh, you know, uh, John was talking about the connection between the land and the, and the, the stream. I mean, it's, it's a direct connection and it's, I'm not just talking about a, a stormwater pipe. It's there's what goes on in the land affects the, the water quality. Uh, the habitat has been degraded. We want to try to bring back uh, the habitat in the stream and along the stream. Uh, we want to improve this, the stream corridors. The wastewater treatment plants are very much involved. We need to, uh, or, or they, they understand that they need to improve the quality of their effluent and they've been doing that. Back in 2005, they made some substantial upgrades. And since then they've been working to optimize their uh, effluent levels. And eventually we want to see water quality uh, improve. The creek itself, there's 24 miles of streams. It's 64 square miles, approximately 160,000 residents. That's pretty dense in places. Um, it's a beautiful stream. Uh, I don't want to give you the impression it's it's not it. There are some beautiful stretches of of this stream, but because of that, people like to live, you know, in and around the watershed. And so we have a lot of uh, development. Some of it very dense, twenty nine percent impervious, and and the headwaters uh, is it, it's it, it's a storm basin in a, a shopping center parking lot. So that yellow ar arrow in that bottom slide behind this big box store is a storm basin, a stormwater management facility, and uh, that's the, the headwaters of the Wissahickon Creek. Back pre-1970, a lot of the watershed was rural. There was development occurring, uh, but a lot of it was uh, agricultural. And over the uh, next <clears throat> few decades, a lot of development occurred, a lot of impervious surfaces coming along with it, a lot of uh, compacted lawn areas, the use of herbicides, pesticides, uh, road salt, as you heard, uh, <clears throat> and just the conversion of land from um, farmland to suburban housing uh, has disrupted the, the hydrology of the stream and the water quality of the stream. Um, and the, <clears throat> the result is that the, this map, which shows the gray areas, that was land developed without runoff controls. I mean, we tend to think these days, so you know, development occurs and, and where are they putting their stormwater facilities? Back in the 70s and, and even into the 1980s in some places, development was occurring and there may not be any stormwater controls. And if there were, they may be uh, just you know, drains, storm drains in the streets that conveyed the water directly to the stream. But in some case, there, was, there wasn't even that. Um, so we're seeing a lot of area where the, the uh, development has occurred without any kind of stormwater controls. And that has disrupted the hydrology. And if you're an organism living in a stream that's very flashy, it's difficult to uh, <clears throat> survive. For example, this isn't any particular storm. It's not a named storm you know, that comes up uh, the coast or anything. This is just a few days in May, uh, back in 2017, I just pulled this off the, the, the uh, USGS web page as, as an example, it shows the Wissahickon's reaction to uh, uh, just your, your uh, spring storm. Very quickly, the storm, the, uh, the flow increases. All of the water is conveyed quickly to the stream. Stream rises and then it falls again. And one of the interesting things about this graph, if you look, you can see as the stream flow is returning back towards the, uh, the median, uh, there are a series of, of humps where it rises and falls and rises and falls. And that is uh, the result of wastewater treatment plant discharge. There, as I said, there's four wastewater treatment plants in the um, watershed and about, I think it's about 10 million gallons per day is their contribution, their total contribution to the flow. So they do have a, uh, an influence on, on the stream hydrology and on the water quality 
uh, within the stream as well. So we worked with the partnership and we've put together a water quality improvement plan in draft. And our uh, overall uh, strategy is one of adaptive management. We want to, uh, we've identified actions to be taken, but we're not just going to take those actions and hope that they uh, achieve our, our goals. We're gonna be monitoring as we go. And if we find that there are particular solutions or actions that we take that have a uh, significant uh, improvement impact, we, we want to do more of them. And if there are things that we think are gonna help and that we, that we implement and they, they don't seem to work very well, we wanna find out why. So there's, a, there's a, an adaptive approach to implementing this plan. And I'll, I'll get into the details of the plan in a moment. It is a collaborative effort, not just between the municipalities and the wastewater treatment plants, but DEP and EPA have been very involved in this process, very uh, supportive, uh, <clears throat> and it's it's been a it's been a very um, rewarding uh, relationship with the with the regulators. They've been very helpful. Um, it's data driven. The Wissick and Watershed, if if you're familiar with this area. Uh, there's people often say it's one of the most studied watersheds in the in southeastern PA. And there's a lot of data out there, and uh, the uh, Philadelphia Water Department has done a great job in pulling all that data together and uh, uh, understanding how this study affects that study and the, and the data points and the data that's been collected. Um, there's a lot of ongoing activities. Even now, the wastewater treatment plants and the, and the municipalities are implementing projects. So it's not like we're waiting for the plan to be approved before we begin uh, the work. Uh, and that work is, again, the focus is first to, to restore the hydrology as much as we can, assess the benefits of our work, uh, possibly focus on nutrients um, more after that, but we, we think as long as the hydrology is disturbed, it's very difficult to see improvements in the um, IBI scores just because the, the bugs are finding it so difficult to uh, persist in the, in the flashy stream. Oops, go back. So there's a lot of data out there. And uh, John mentioned the uh, Chester County uh, study. The, um, that's been very helpful. Uh, <clears throat> but there are other studies. There's a stormwater management plan done with Temple's assistance and the Philadelphia Water Department uh, was the lead on that. There was a, uh, there's a survey of storm basins, stormwater facilities throughout the watershed, so we can begin to focus on them. The USGS continually collects data, Philadelphia Water continually collects data, DEP does too. Wissick and Trails has a stream watcher program. There's a lot of data out there. Temple did a two-year study of the stream, so instead of just a snapshot, they have some uh, long-term uh, data that they've analyzed. Uh, <clears throat> so there's a lot of data out there informing this uh, study and supporting, you know, our, our contention that, you know, we first want to work primarily on uh, hydrology. As I mentioned, the wastewater treatment plants are working now uh, on nutrients, but we want to focus on hydrology first and see what we can do and then work on uh, other, other aspects. The recommendations are broken down into uh, projects, policies, and programs for the municipalities to implement. <clears throat> and I'll give you a little more on that in a moment. And the wastewater treatment plants concurrently are, are working to optimize their, their flows. Philadelphia Water Department uh, is taking on the, the monitoring aspect, although DEP will continue their water quality uh, testing. Uh, so we will be assessing the, the impact of our actions Certainly reporting that, we need to document everything we're doing uh, to the regulators, um, but we need that information in order to um, assess what we're doing and, and possibly uh, tinker with, with our approach over a long-term implementation period. So municipal actions will include things like uh, <clears throat> stream bank stabilization, uh, routing, uh, more runoff through, uh, basins, either new basins or existing basins, uh, naturalized retrofitted basins. We have a, a concept that we call area treated. Going back to that map that showed all the gray areas that, that did not have stormwater management, how much of that stormwater can we get uh, into uh, a stormwater facility that has water quality um, improvement aspects to it, maybe some infiltration to support groundwater. We want to increase the, uh, the area treated. Um, uh, within the watershed. 
uh, riparian buffer plantings will be a big part of that stream bank restoration like the picture you see here a really nice project that was done uh, with uh, Wissigan Trails, Pico, uh, Upper Gwynedd was involved, um, Merck I think was involved as well, DEP, a, a number of people, William Penn, where they converted an area where the banks were eroding uh, pretty significantly to a much more um, gentle uh, stream bank, uh, stabilized stream bank and looking to improve water quality by removing the uh, sediment that, that comes from that erosion. But there's also policies and programs and policies could involve ordinance work by the municipalities to require uh, green stormwater infrastructure in redevelopment projects, or perhaps a, uh, you know, a, a unified riparian buffer ordinance across all the municipalities in the watershed. And programs, we've, we, there's a, some good examples, Philadelphia Water Department, has a, a stormwater uh, facility, a residential stormwater uh, subsidy program where people can put in rain gardens and downspout planters and so on. Uh, we'd like to extend that. <clears throat> and the, the Wissick and Trails uh, group that I've mentioned, they are extensively involved in education and promotion from you know, school children all the way up to uh, you know, having programs for adults. And, and that's the way we get the, the, the word out. So we're looking to uh, rely on them heavily for education and promotion. And the treatment plants, as I mentioned, are not, not just sitting on their hands. They are working to uh, optimize their treatment processes as we're doing uh, this other work. But we feel that we need to get the hydrology under control before we really focus on other uh, aspects of the uh, impairment. So the two things together, the the <clears throat> we continue to apply the best technology in the treatment plants and we evaluate the impact of the municipal projects uh, is the uh, backbone of our uh, implementation portion of, of the plan. <clears throat> we have uh, models of the watershed that were created by uh, Temple that we can continue to use as we evaluate our projects, uh, policies and programs that we, we're looking at what we think is a 20 year implementation period, which is very long for a planning process, uh, pro probably broken down into five year phases. And I, I'm kind of waffling here because we're not quite sure what DEP and EPA are going to require in terms of uh, permitting uh, during the implementation phase. But in my, our mind, it makes sense to do this. Uh, we have a long-term monitoring program and uh, various metrics, not just one number, not just one target, but uh, we're looking at like this area treated that I mentioned before, uh, the amount of open space we can preserve, the amount of habitat we can restore, uh, possibly looking at things like uh, the dissolved oxygen swings. Can we, can we um, minimize the amplitude of those swings or possibly you know, <clears throat> start looking at um, delaying the onset of, of delayed, or excuse me, reduced dissolved oxygen in, in the spring uh, uh, or uh, bringing the dissolved oxygen back later on in the summer through a number of, of, of programs. So there's a number of targets that we're looking at, not just one uh, silver bullet. Uh, and, and we're hoping to get within a, a, we're hoping to identify a healthy range for each of these metrics that uh, we feel if we can get into the range, the acceptable range of, of you know, the vast majority of these metrics, then we know that we are doing something to improve uh, conditions in the stream. Administration is going to be difficult. You know, we, we have held the, the partnership together um, since 2015 when it was formed, but we are looking at uh, a 20 year implementation period and municipal boards change over that time. Um, you know, people come and go, they get elected, they, they, they step down. So maintaining support, financial support is going to be very important. We're hoping to supplement the dues that the municipalities pay with, with, a, with grants. Uh, and we've been talking with Penvest uh, about a low interest loan program. Uh, and we're looking to leverage the, the, the capacity and resources of our partners uh, as, we, as we move forward into implementation. The interaction we've had with the regulators has been very rewarding. Uh, we've just completed a series of what we're calling small group meetings rather than having you know, 15 people from the EPA and, and 15 more from DEP and we all sit in a room together and discuss things. We're meeting with just a few people, uh, a few of the, the more involved staff people to go over some of the issues such as endpoints and metrics and, and permitting. 
<clears throat> DEP has provided data to us. Uh, EPA and DEP have provided suggestions, a lot of good comments. It's been a very cooperative kind of engagement, which is uh, really what you're looking for. So often, you know, I find that the municipalities are on the opposite side of the table is from the uh, regulators. But in this case, there's been a lot of, of cooperative effort. Uh, and I think it shows in, in, the, uh, in the plan. So once we get the plan revised based on the comments we've gotten from the regulators and submit it for approval, uh, we can begin the implementation period. And, and uh, on the right, there's, a, there's a, just a snapshot of some of the projects that we're looking to implement. I think it's interesting to note that a lot of those projects we're projecting will take place on uh, private land. The municipalities themselves don't have enough land to implement all of the projects we feel necessary to manage stormwater better and, and bring that uh, hydrology back uh, to where it should be. So we're going to be looking to engage uh, private owners. And I'll make a, a shameless plea if there's anybody on this um, seminar this this morning that uh, you know you represent an institution or, or some large land old holder in the Wissahickon and you'd like to pursue this further please get in touch with me and we'll uh, we'll talk but we do have a 20-year implementation period uh, as I mentioned it's adaptive management uh, we're going to be looking at how we're doing and, and making changes that we think will uh, bring us even better results and, and we'll be monitoring the, um, the implementation process so we can document our, our success and also see what we need to do better. So that's what I had uh, to discuss this morning. If there's any questions, I'd be glad to, uh, to take them now. Yes, thank you, Drew. Uh, fantastic to you know, go from the theoretical and the big picture to an actual watershed where you're dealing with that regulatory structure of the TMDL. Um, and, and you know, why it has limitations uh, in your instance and why you think you guys have a better path forward. So, so really exciting, uh, happy to see um, kind of the creative approach and the timelines that you're working under. We do have um, uh, questions um, uh, to start with uh, from Jeremy, um, uh, was asking about for total phosphorus in the watershed. And I don't know if you have these numbers available or no, um, broadly speaking, uh, what proportion of the total phosphorus comes from the wastewater plants versus lawn fertilizer versus other main sources? And then as a follow-up, um, Jeremy is also asking um, about the institutional memory. He, uh, he's saying that one of the big benefits has been your specific long tenure to, to maintain that kind of institutional continuity. Um, but that's not always the norm. So, so the specific question about uh, uh, the percentages of total phosphorus, but also can you speak to um, that continuity? And, and there have been some big changes, um, you know, with some of the key people you and I, Drew, have spoken right. about um, in the Southeast region of Pennsylvania DEP and EPA, um, but um, you've been able to maintain this uh, even despite that. Uh, yeah, and, and Jeremy, I'm sorry, I don't have the, that phosphorus information right at my fingertips, but I, I can get it. Um, my my email is listed there on the screen. If you want to just shoot me an email, I can I can get that information for you. Uh, and as to the second part, you're absolutely right. We've we've had some. Um, we, we we're fortunate to have a a, a pretty deep bench, but uh, you know we've lost some some players. You know, right, right at the very beginning of, of the process, uh, you know, Jeff Featherstone, who was so instrumental through Temple with a lot of the work we had been doing, you know, he passed away unexpectedly, and, and that was just a huge blow. Uh, and uh, we've had other people, you know, come and go. They take other jobs. They they move out of the area. As as I mentioned, you know, we we uh, municipal officials change, and you know, we've had some folks on our uh, management committee, the the representation from the municipalities. Um, you know, and, and they, they don't get elected, <laughs> you know, the, the, for, the, for another term or, or they retire. And it's, 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 it's a huge issue. But I think, you know, we have enough people involved that, that even, you know, when somebody leaves, there's other people that have been involved long enough that they can sort of uh, pick up the, 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 the mantle and, and continue. Um, but that is a concern and, and just uh, public support as well. This is not going to be a, a cheap alternative. It's going to be less expensive, I think, than the TMDL, but it's going to be expensive. And 
you know, how do you maintain public support so that the municipal boards see, oh, this is important to our constituents. We want to continue spending the money to implement it. That, that is a major concern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fascinating. Right. And <clears throat> again, you already spoke with a 20-year time frame, you know, is not trivial. Yeah. Um, yeah. for, for all of those pieces to stay in, in place. Um, and, and kudos to you guys for already being able to keep that coalition together. Um, oh, another question uh, is, um, you mentioned some of the metrics that you're using and that you're focusing, you know, first on the hydrology um, um, and as, as kind of a, a key part of the beginning phases, the first phases there. Um, how do you know when you've reached that goal of, of repairing the hydrology? Like, do you have, you know, a certain base flow measurement? And, and maybe this is a, you know, really technical question. Um, or how how high the peak is with a, a given stormwater? You showed that hydrograph from USGS. Um, uh, so not just, you know, how much area have you treated, but something in stream. You also mentioned the dissolved oxygen swings. Right. Well, you know, the the, the main thing we are looking at. It, well, I shouldn't say it that way, but but the 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 metric there is primarily the area treated. And early on in the study, working with uh, Temple, working with Philadelphia Water Department, uh, we determined a, a goal of of uh, nine thousand additional acres of runoff uh, being managed by stormwater facilities. And that that seems like a big number, but it's and it is when, when you're looking at it from from my chair, but uh, uh, a lot of a lot of the work has been done uh, through the MS4 program already. You know, we've had uh, seven years of, of of work, so that number keeps coming down. But the the thought was, if we can get to a point where we're now managing that additional amount of stormwater, um, then you know, we should see some some noticeable significant improvements in the hydrology in the watershed. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so, so looking at, again, you mentioned the adaptive management loop, right. Where um, the, the continued data collection can tell you as you approach that 9,000 acres, what kind of changes are you seeing? And is that enough or do you have to up that number or. Right. You know, yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing because the, the municipalities, they, they deal with you know, budgets and they deal with compliance to you know, regulatory programs. And, and they especially want to know when a, how are we going to know when we're done? They want to say, okay, we did this, now we're done. And it, it's been an educational process, you know, getting them to understand, well, it, it's not like you're never going to be done, but we're going to reach a point where we're saying we're almost done and now we need to do this additional work. And that that period of time might stretch longer than the 20 year implementation. Uh, it's a possibility. Yeah, that, that's a good part of that adaptive management loop, right? Like it's not saying, oh, Right. We just spent however many million dollars as you approach that 20, you're like, oh, now we're going to have to spend that same amount going forward. What you're talking about are some fine tuning as you approach that 20 year timeline, right? Like right. Th there are certain things that we did well, other things maybe that we needed to focus more time on. I think similar to what John Jackson was talking about, things that right. we weren't anticipating back in 1972, like road salt as, as being a big part of that. Is, is yeah. road salt at all part of the Tohicken Creek? stressor profile that you guys are trying to to handle and and, and right and in a and a stormwater basin doesn't necessarily you know remove that entirely from the watershed is that something you guys are you're absolutely doing? right and, and and that's one of the things that that's come up occasionally with discussions um and and what we're likely going to have to include uh, at, at a later point um you know the the the, the non-point source runoff from uh, golf courses, from large institutional properties, even you know residential areas. Um, not just phosphorus, you know, needs to be addressed as well. So we can, you know, I envision that that we'll be adding uh, as as we're able to get certain aspects, you know, better uh, under control or, or show improvement in certain areas. Then then we might be able to take on additional areas. During the imp implementation period, and, and road salt could be one of them. Right, right. Another thing. Can I just uh, add in for a second, Eric, John. on that one, just because I was looking at that while Drew was talking. I went to the two USGS gauges. So salt is in the 100, 150 milligrams per liter chloride. Um, if you were in Maryland or you were in Ohio, 
they would be targeting it as saying it was salt stress. They might not be used impaired and their target is 50 milligrams. So right now the Wissahickon is double to triple. Uh, that's in main stem areas. The tribs are no doubt much higher. Um, so that, that, that's something, if you were in Canada, 150 is the, is, is the, the criterion they're using. So the um, US hasn't reissued since 88, and at some point they might, but right. um, the Wissahickon is, is, is at least 10, if not 15 to 20 times saltier in the main stem, lower main stem than it was um, 50 to 75 years ago, probably. Okay. And I, I think that comes, uh, that speaks to the, the educational process too. And when you, your example in, in, in Maryland, is a great one because you know they they looked at the problem and they said what can we do about it uh, we still need to you know maintain safety during you know ice storms and so on on the roads during the winter but are, are there things we can do or changes we can make to how we apply or what we apply or or even just training for the 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 folks driving the trucks uh that will reduce our our, our use of salt and, and that kind of uh, training is 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 essential if we're going to address things like that. Yeah, yeah, no, fascinating, right? I I think all of us are interested um, uh, to see how the Wissahickon evolves, and and we are hoping for the greatest success, you know, for everybody involved. Um, Here we are. Yeah. It's it, it's a it's a really big undertaking and and really kind of an experiment, right? To see, um, you know. Not, not to just focus on a single number, like you like you mentioned at the beginning of just total phosphorus. It, it is a broader um, set of stressors that are that are affecting the Wissahickon, right? And how we can we start to improve, like you said, you know, the the bugs and fish that are there, um, so that we all benefit.